All right, so we are officially live and would like to welcome all of you on behalf of the Southeastern School Behavioral Health Community, as well as the Behavioral Alliance of South Carolina, to this month's national webinar featuring the incredible, the incomparable, and wonderfully kind Dr. Dawn Anderson Butcher from Ohio State University. So um, y'all, today I'm going to take care of a little bit of housekeeping, and then I'm going to throw it over to Dr. Anderson Butcher for our presentation. So we do ask that during the presentation, you utilize your chat box and our Q&A features, and I will make sure to field all questions to Dr. Anderson Butcher during our presentation. We're going to be seeing some incredible videos today that you guys are going to be able to engage with. I'm going to make sure to put all relevant links in your chat box. And of course, if y'all have any questions, comments, or anything that you would like to connect with after today's presentation, you can always reach out to us at bask at mailbox.sc.edu. And you could also reach out to us, of course, on our website at www.schoolbehavioralhealth.org. So first and foremost, let's go ahead and I'm going to populate our pre-survey. So if you all would just please take a moment, just about one minute here, uh, to complete that poll, we would greatly appreciate it. And Dr. Anderson Butcher, while we are getting this poll going, why don't we go ahead and get our presentation up and running and um, I'll allow you to share a little bit about yourself and, and your work with our community today. Y'all are slowly getting in those answers. Thank you so much. It's really important for us to have that data to track. So we appreciate y'all participating. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end that polling now. All right. And Dr. Dawn Anderson Butcher, we're gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you so much for joining us today and lending your expertise and innovations to um, all of these critical conversations. All right, thank you so much, Taylor. And, and I really appreciate the invitation to share with all of you down in, in Southeastern the United States and South Carolina, my friends at um, USC. So thank you for having me, uh, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I'm gonna talk today a little bit about uh, our university-wide initiative at Ohio State called Life Sports and really sort of showcase the ways in which we pivoted during COVID-19 and then some of the lessons that we learned as we now kind of venture out of this pandemic and into maybe a little bit more normalcy. So um, let me give you a little overview. I'm gonna first talk about youth sport as a context uh, and, and have you thinking a little bit about how we can use this venue you know, to do behavioral mental health and to support positive youth development. And then I'll showcase you know, our live sports model that's a national exemplar uh, all across the country. We were just highlighted most recently in the national youth sports strategy by the federal government. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about, you know, how we do life sports in a traditional year and then then really, really dig deep on how we pivoted last year during COVID, some of the things we're doing this summer, and then broader implications that we sort of see as opportunities for doing this work post pandemic. So with that said, let me get going. Um, I'm not telling this you all anything new. Um, perhaps maybe you're more behavioral mental health um, that are sitting with us today, but well, we know about kids um, in the United States in particular that they're struggling with a lot of different issues. And these numbers are pre-pandemic. So we have 7,000 young people dropping out of school every day. Uh, we, kids have limited access to food. Um, there's a lot of food insecurity. One in seven children are uh, victims of abuse and neglect. Uh, as we know, and we talk a lot about uh, with my dear colleague, Mark Weiss, um, that um, 20 to 30% of all kids have some kind of social, emotional, behavioral um, disturbance at any given time. Um, we also have health implications around overweight and obesity, um, a lot of sedentary lifestyle behavior, uh, especially in relationship to just basic physical activity. Um, in relationship to sport, what we know is about 60% of all kids drop out of sport by the age of 12. Uh, and, and that can, can become a, a pretty significant issue, especially when we look at all the benefits sport can have for healthy youth development. And I'm not gonna go into this in detail here, but you can see outlined, you know, the various physical, psychological, social, um, behavioral mental health types of things that um, are so prevalent in our world today. Um, and, and these are the ways in which sport can make a huge difference. So for us at Life Sports and at Ohio State University, our question is, well, how do we use sport, right? To do 
this good work with kids and to address, to address some of these broader social implications. Um, and so our mission overall is really to prepare youth for life and leadership through sport. And so we do that through three different strategies university-wide. The one that I'm gonna spend the most of the time talking about today, which is really our focus, is what we do with kids. Um, and this involves providing you know, quality sport-based youth development programming, especially for kids from very vulnerable circumstances in Central Ohio and beyond. Um, we also have a pretty explicit teaching and learning objectives. So a lot of students come to study with us in pre-service education and in doctoral programs and master's programs. Um, and we're really looking towards how do we prepare better leaders for tomorrow so that they can do the work in schools, sports, public health, coaching, um, dentistry, medicine, whatever it is, so that they can have these principles uh, with them, not just about how to address risk and resilience, but how to think about play and sport in positive ways for kids. And then we have a very explicit research agenda over the course of um, about the last 14, 15 years. We've published over 30 plus articles, manuscripts. Um, if you're interested in any of that research, I'm happy to share it with you um, at another time, but I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on it here today. So um, what I do wanna focus on mostly is, is what we've been doing with kids. And so uh, over the course of the last 12 years, since we were originally, um, branded life sports at Ohio State. We've served over 8,000 youth in Central Ohio. Um, each year uh, on campus and out in the community, we um, serve at least 700 kids. Uh, and, and last summer during COVID and throughout this academic year, we've served over 400. Um, you can see the demographics of the young people that we serve at life sports. So a lot of kids of color, black and brown kids. We have 95% of our kids are living in poverty pretty extreme um, exposure to ex traumatic life events. We, we suggest that about 20% of our kids in our program need some kind of behavioral intervention when they're here. Um, and we have to staff in order to make sure that that happens. Um, and kind of the unique thing is that it, it's not um, one community that we serve, that essentially kids from all over central Ohio, you know, a huge metropolitan city, come on campus during the summer in a typical year um, for sport-based programming. Uh, and that's really important, especially when we think about some of the um, cultural and, and uh, community building that we do at camp across zip codes, across neighborhoods, across gangs and whatnot. So at any rate, at the center of life sports and, and our work with kids and our work in teaching and research is our model. And to kind of ground this in social emotional learning, I want to focus in on what our four core social skills are that we hone in on at life sports. And we call them the acronym SETS. So S-E-T-S. -E um, our first foremost skill that we focus on is self-control. And this is, you know, emotional regulation, being able to stop, think, and act and, and sort of resolve situations um, and control your emotions. Um, effort is our second social skill we land on. And that's really trying your best, doing self-directed behavior, putting forth 100%, you know, keep trying even when maybe you're failing um, and trying to get towards mastery and improvement. Um, the third one is teamwork, it's our T, and this is more um, explicit in sport that lots of people think about is, you know, how do you work together, communicate, problem solve um, in order to win a game or pass the ball or get, make a touchdown or whatever the, the end goal might be. And then last, um, our final social skill is social responsibility. A lot of times think, people think of this as a value, but we really teach it as a skill. And it's this decision that we can cognitively make to do the right thing when no one's looking to be a leader, to be a role model, and to take what we learn in life sports and apply it in other areas of our lives. So we become very ex explicit and intentional about those sets, and we do that in everything that goes on at life sports. Um, I'm gonna stop here and give you a little video. Um, this is uh, our director of operations, Becky Wade Motivadian. And we're going to teach you how to pass the soccer ball. And also we wanna know how we can use teamwork while playing soccer, and then how we can use teamwork when we're not at soccer, okay? So when you're at school or when you're at home, um, we want to use teamwork in all these different settings. Life Sports is really a youth development initiative here at The Ohio State University where we use sport to teach kids really basic social skills that they can use the rest of their life. At Life Sports, we really teach what we call SETS. So SETS stands for S is self-control, E is effort, T is teamwork, and the final S is social responsibility. Those are taught through two main areas. The first is chalk talk. So every day a kid would come to the Life Sports summer camp, they would receive chalk talk. 
Chalk Talk is a one hour lesson. It's play based social skills. So the kids go into a classroom to start. They, they start talking about what the social skill is of the day, how that's used in their life. But then we usually take them out onto a field or outside of the classroom and try to do an activity with them that that really teaches that lesson that can stick with them. Does anyone remember what our set is? Are our sets today? Self control. Good. Self control. Each of those activities, those kids are being taught that social skill again by the recreation leader. But every sport you go to reinforces the social skill of the day that is taught in Chalk Talk that day. So when you arrive at soccer, for instance, the topic of the day should be one of the social skills, self-control effort, teamwork, or social responsibility. Myself and Coach Tark, we're going to teach you how to pass the soccer ball, and also we want to know how we can use teamwork while playing soccer, and then how we can use teamwork when we're not at soccer, okay? So when you're at school or when you're at home, um, we want to use teamwork in all these different settings. And so we have about 45 minutes of physical activity inside each session. All right, guys, how else can we use teamwork? So Ariel's encouraging his team really well over here, okay? He's, he's clapping, he's using some hand signals. Are we making eye contact enough to pass to our teammates? Jason, how else can we use eye contact? At the end of that 45 minutes, they'll sit down and do a, a debrief with the kids. The debrief will review both the, the sport skill and the social skill that was taught through the lesson and really discuss with the kids how they, how they felt they were doing that. Where were examples? How could the kids identify when they used both the sport skill and the social skill? What was the sets for today? Teamwork. Teamwork, all right. All right, and so who can tell me how they use teamwork um, today when we are during our drills, all right? Uh, what is it? Say it loud so we can hear you. Eye Good. Eye Great contact. eye contact. Yeah. Wave hands. Hand waving. Good. What were you going to say? Uh, complimenting our teammates. Complimenting. Good. So you always want to stay positive and let them know they're doing an awesome job. Yeah. What were you going to uh, say? Um, another way you can use it is um, communicating by saying their name. Good. I like the name. The name's really important. No matter what you're doing, the name's really important. We could use teamwork lots of different ways today at soccer. I bet you guys use it when you're at basketball or when you're at football. But what about when we're not playing a sport? How else can we use teamwork maybe when we go home? Uh, by oh. helping out doing the chores and stuff. By Perfect. helping to do some chores? Do you I have siblings? Who has siblings here? So maybe you and your siblings can work together to take out the trash no. or wash the dishes, no. okay? Yeah, you help but, your parents out. Okay, yeah. but if you guys work yeah. together, it'll get done faster, right? Yeah. I help, sometimes I help my grandma cook. You help your grandma cook? That's really nice of you. Sometimes. And then that helps out the rest of your family too, so they can eat a really yummy meal, right? Yeah, yeah I, I bet you're a good cook. I, I help with my mom a lot. Okay, how do you help your mama? Everybody's seen the Ohio State Buckeyes football team. They have the, that iconic helmet they wear with the iconic Buckeye Leave stickers on it. So we've modified that and we actually give the kids buttons here at camp. So every kid during a session or throughout the day, if we see them modeling a social skill or exemplifying a social skill, one of our staff members hands them that button. So Coach Tark and I have a couple buttons we want to hand out to some of our awesome campers that were showing teamwork today, okay? So the camper that I'm going to give my, my button to, um, she volunteered early on today. Um, she participated a lot when I was asking questions, and she showed some great skill when we were passing and receiving the ball, okay? So all of these little things from the beginning of our session all the way to the very end um, contributed to this button, okay? So for that, Kanaya gets the teamwork button. Round of applause for Kanaya, guys. Hopefully through those three means, both the chalk talk, the sport reinforcement, and then the reward system of getting Buckeye leaves, we're hoping that these kids really start to value these critical social skills and use them not just here at Ohio State, but when they go back into their communities. And what we're really trying to do at Life Sports is, is teach the kids how to use these different sets in the sport and then kind of how to transfer it to other parts of their life. I've seen kids who were kind of like troublemakers and want to be, you could tell they didn't really want to be here and now they're just like thriving. Like they're doing so well. Um, they branch out, they made a ton of friends and they're so respectful. Um, they participate in everything and it's really cool to see that change in just a few short weeks.
So hopefully that gives you a good idea of, of what we do at Life Sports. Um, I'm just going to briefly review some of those components. So Becky talked a little bit about our 15 hours of chalk talk instruction, again, focused on sets. You can see here the curricular layout and the kinds of activities that might happen under each one of those core social skills. What happens over the course of the camp, though, is that the kids move towards more goal-directed team group dynamics where they prepare and get ready for our Life Sports Olympic Games, which are the last week of camp. And during those time periods, they actually compete in their age cohort against the other teams um, and collect points over the course of three or four days where then they you know, announce a champion. Um, and not only do they compete in sports, but they do compete in a Chalk Talk Challenge too. So it's sort of an experiential learning activity where the kids have to work together, demonstrate sets, and then they get judged on you know, how well they showed self-control, worked together as a team, and ultimately um, finished whatever the challenge was that it was. Additionally, within the Chalk Talk curriculum, we have the kids do journal. Uh, and, and those are kind of fun to do, but um, four times throughout Chalk Talk, they actually get to write or reflect or draw pictures to think about their um, learning and how they can apply what they've learned at Life Sports into real life. And so this is just an example of some of the research that um, one of our graduate students did one year. You can see here a picture where um, a, a child is applying the learning of self-control um, outside of camp. This is one at school looking at effort. And here's an example you know, of working together with peers and demonstrating social responsibility and friendship. So with that said, you know, each of the sessions then um, incorporates this debriefing process where we really encourage the kids to take what they did here and apply it somewhere else. Um, and that's pretty explicit, both in the Chalk Talk and also in the sport curriculum. And so this example here is um, one of our uh, eight sports that we offer at Life Sports. Um, over the course of the camp, in a traditional year, they get five hours of eight different sports, which for us at Life Sports is really important um, because it offers kids sports sampling. They're able to sort of try out and test many different kinds of sports to see how and if they like any of them. And for the kids that we serve, many of them have never played lacrosse. Many of them have not um, learned how to swim. Um, many have not had a lot of opportunities for baseball and some of the other sports that, um, that we do, uh, like tennis at camp. Uh, we have five hours of instruction in each of the sports. And again, the sports follow the same kind of outline as a session for Chalk Talk. They preview the skill. They talk about what they're going to learn today. They're very explicit cues. So for example, if you were doing basketball, it would be dribbling with your fingertips, you know, following through towards the target. Um, if you were passing a soccer ball, it'd be using your instep, opening up at the hip, following through to the target. Um, whatever it is that they are, we really encourage the use of these key feedback and specific cues. And then we encourage as well the reinforcement of the sets. So when we see kids pass a ball to a teammate, it's a great pass using the instep, but it's also really good teamwork. When they master a three-point shot and they're using the right technique and they do three in a row, we talk to them about effort, but also how they've been using the right technique in order to shoot that basketball. And so all of the skills that we're teaching are embedded and integrated very intentionally within the sports setting. A couple last things about the camp, just to make sure everyone knows about it. It's free to campers. We have an amazing philanthropic community um, in Central Ohio who helps fund life sports. Um, we also receive about 40% of our budget each year from the Department of Athletics at Ohio State. And there are also other units on campus like the College of Social Work and Outreach and Engagement that provide in-kind and physical resources. Very important for the young people we serve are two meals per day. Um, we have transportation that goes out into communities across the city and picks kids up from their local communities and brings them on campus and then takes them home um, at the end of the day. And this is really an access issue um, and also ensures that there's continuity and consistency in the kids' attendance over time. I talked about the Olympics already. Uh, we also embed parent and family involvement into different roles and responsibilities, not just in the summer, but during the um, year. And our team offers health and dental visits if they need them and also referral and linkages. So we've, you know, of course made referrals for behavioral mental health, but also to child welfare or to housing supports. Um, what we found over time is as families engage in live sports, we become their family and they oftentimes call us and reach out to us when they don't know what to do or, or have anybody to call. Um, Another element of life sports I think is important is what we call our booster sessions. So if you think about like vaccination right now, 
they're, you know, we're, we're thinking about how we might have to have another COVID-19 vaccination or a booster session in the fall to control for the variants. Well, boosters are really important in social emotional learning programming and social skill development because we should follow up with kids over time post program in order to make sure that the kids are using the skills, applying them and continue to build those relationships over a longer period of time. So we offer um, 10 clinics on campus at Ohio State, usually um, in partnership with our athletic teams on campus. So the men's gymnastics team might host all the kids in um, the Steelwood gymnastics facility and the kids are learning how to jump in the pit and do the pummel horse and swing on the rings. Um, or they might be you know, hanging out in the Woody Hayes facility with the football team and, and running routes with um, Justin Fields or whoever the, the star athletes might be. Um, these are also really important for long-term engagement in life sports. So if families can attend the program at least three times during the academic year, uh, then they, uh, they get automatic registration into the camp the other summer, the next summer coming up, which is, for us is really important because we turn away about 150 kids each year for life sports in a traditional non-pandemic year. Because of that growth and our wait list, um, we've done a couple different things that have happened. Um, we, and I'm not gonna focus on them, but we do have a high school youth leadership academy. This is for kids who have engaged at life sports as a camper and wanna continue on their journey, learning with us about sets, about other leadership and professionalism and college and career skills. Um, and we have a high school program for about 60 kids each year. This year we had 52 of them still participating and actually 32 of them are gonna work camp this summer um, as youth leaders um, and counselors. So um, really exciting kind of pathway towards higher ed or to career or even to the military. Um, I mentioned this turning away of kids, 150 each year. About three years ago, we um, had the opportunity to increase the number of kids that we served by moving life sports out into a city of Columbus Parks and Recreation facility. So we served another 84 kids out at Beatty Community Center, which is on the Near East Side in Columbus, and it allowed us to expand our reach and increase our capacity. We're doing this a little bit more now um, and actually have our first site um, in Springfield, Ohio, that's opening this summer. So just real briefly, some of our evidence um, over time, what we found through our research is that kids really grow in their self-control effort and teamwork responsibility, specifically during the camp. And they do maintain some of those skills, especially during the um, academic year and come back at a higher level of skill set when they enter program the next year and then continue to grow. Um, our research has really shown the value of transfer and how these booster sessions, the clinics, as well as the support and feedback and the things that parents do and staff do at home and on the field really make a difference in application and learning over time. Uh, Lots of mechanisms have been identified through our research. Um, the ones I love the most are belonging and relationships and, and sort of the peer norms that are created as the kids get to know each other and develop friendships and really strong peer dynamics. And then we certainly have also looked at different kids that you know, benefit the most from life sports. And most importantly, our research shows that the kids come in with the poorest social skills who have the most vulnerabilities grow the most over time. And we're very proud of that. Lastly, a few other um, outcomes outside of sets that we have. Um, we've been able to show cardiovascular fitness improvements over time, um, the adoption of healthy lifestyle behaviors such as drinking more water or eating more fruits and vegetables. Um, and then when we opened our community-based site, most recently we saw a 63% decrease in the level of violence and um, calls to the police department the year after wow. that it was open, which is pretty incredible. Um, Taylor, how are we doing? Any questions so far? Um, I just realized that my audio was on and I said, wow. It's oh. like I think everyone is just as captivated um, as, as I am. So please, by all means, um, continue. This is fantastic. Awesome. Well, I'm, it's going to get a little bit more fun because I have more, more video and platforms to show. So, so nonetheless, um, we've been really um, excited to have um, received some honors from like the Aspen Institute for the Project Play Championship, the National Summer Learning Award. Um, most recently, the Kellogg Foundation, you know, um, awarded us with an outreach and engagement um, honor, which was pretty prestigious. And so we're really proud of the impact we're having with our kids and the science we're developing over time and then how we're using it to disseminate out 
to boys and girls clubs and parks and recreation centers and other youth organizations and even schools so that they can improve their programs. So, so we're really proud of that. And again, if you would like more information about the traditional model, please let me know and I can send you more information. Um, I'm gonna pivot now and talk a little bit about COVID. And, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but you know, a lot of um, data, most importantly, this Medicaid, uh, Medicare and Medicaid report that's out that came out in um, this, this January, February is really packed jam with a lot of great information that for us is super relevant because most of our kids live in poverty art and actually receive Medicaid. Um, but what they're finding over time is that this, this COVID-19 has had a huge, huge impact on kids, not just the fact that kids are not in school. I mean, kids in Columbus City, by the way, just went back to in-person schooling um, about a month ago. And um, what we found over the virtual learning time period, only about 30 to 40% of all kids were logging in on a regular basis. So, so you know, the kids that we serve in Columbus have lost, I think, almost a year of learning, if not more. So we're really, really concerned about their education. Um, and we want to have them back on campus. We want to be serving them this summer. Um, but we were also concerned about these other things that we know were going on last year in the relationship to COVID and then are still happening today. So um, I'm sure you're aware of these things, but we're seeing a lot less kids, you know, being um, referred and, and screened for developmental disabilities, uh, a lot less kids in behavioral mental health care, uh, vaccinations have decreased over time, um, and then certainly we've seen the escalation for some young people in relationship to some behavioral mental health needs. Um, I'm most concerned too about these ER visits, so what we're seeing in our hospitals locally and nationally are that kids are presenting in the ER rooms with a lot more severity of injuries. Um, and, and so they're not being necessary. And then in our child welfare services, our referrals are way down relative to years pre-COVID. And so what we're finding is because kids aren't in sport, they're not in classrooms at schools, they're not being seen by mental health providers, they're in their homes and the neighbors aren't watching them. Um, we're, we're might be really picking up a lot less um, traumatic life events that, that could be going on that certainly we'll find out about sooner or later. So, so nonetheless, last year we fought for life sports and, and we're still fighting for it this year. We just heard um, three weeks ago that we can have kids back on campus, campus with um, different parameters, but I'll share more about that later. So, so nonetheless, the first COVID um, pivot that we did that we thought really it was really, really important. And looking back, you know, we kind of made it up, you know, when we started. Um, but remember last March, and it was like, all of a sudden, it was March 24th, 22nd, whatever the date was, and boom, everything just shut down. And for our kids and families, right, that, you know, it, it took those young people out of social institutions that gave them caring, gave them food access, gave them love, gave them um, engagement with their peers, uh, and, and it was really, really detrimental. Um, so the first thing that we did in partnership with a local foundation here called the Lindy and Fonte Foundation is we created what was called sport in a bag. And we were just really trying to figure out like how do we keep kids engaged in life, right? And not hold up in homes, you know, by themselves and not, um, you know, having social interactions and, and positive, um, engaging achievement orient, oriented um, experiences to participate in, sorry. Um, and so what we did is we created sport in a bag where we actually had bags and you can see the young girl sitting there with hers and each kid got a ball. It could be a football, a basketball or soccer ball. They got to choose. And then we created um, a life sports at home toolkit. And I'm showing you here the basketball one and it had little drills right, that kids could do with the equipment that they had in their bag. And so they might have had a jump rope too and some cones. Um, they got a ball and then they could flip through and actually follow those drills and become more active. Um, in addition, we talked about sets in the front end of this particular document. Um, and we also had some goal setting that they could do at home with their parents in order to practice um, both the drills and also their life skills as they were out um, in, in their homes, socially distanced um, during this crazy, crazy time. Um, we did some surveys of parents of kids that received these bags. And I was really blown away by the impact because I kind of thought, well, this is just us feeling like we needed to do something during the pandemic. But what we found was 
that 58% of the parents reported that their kids played with that ball frequently, right, um, once they received it. And about 80% said they played that sport more than what they had done pre-pandemic, which was pretty powerful. Um, it was also very interesting to say, we wanted to know if like kids even opened up the, the curriculum packet, Life Sports at Home, and parents indicated that 85% of them said that the kids and them opened up their packets and did drills that were um, existing in them. And I was blown away by this one because the parents reported that 59%, well, 59% of the parents reported that their kids actually set goals for being more active or to do all the drills in their um, life sports at home packet. And so this very little intervention, which was just really like a distribution site. So you can see the Lindy and Fonte van there, you know, where people could come by in their cars, socially distanced with masks and pick up their bag through the window, or in some cases would pop their trunk and we'd throw them in there and they took off and went home. Um, or we would actually deliver bags to certain kids um, that maybe were connected in life sports that we were new, didn't have transportation, were a little bit more socially isolated. We took things to them and you can see the back of one of our staff members cars there. So, so at any rate, with the Lindy and Fonte Foundation support, um, they you know, came in as a champion and paid for all of the equipment and bags. And they together, had, together we distributed over about 10,000 bags across Central Ohio and beyond. So um, they're amazing. And, and I would encourage you to connect with their website because it's a pretty phenomenal new foundation that I know will do a lot more in the future. The second pivot that we did was um, continued with our community-based programming. And so the city of Columbus wanted kids back in their centers because they knew the detriments of kids being on the streets unsupervised while parents were working and also having had the kids out of school since March. So, so they were really um, connected closely with the county public health department and figured out a way to provide socially distanced, safe, experiences for kids in their rec centers last summer, which I thought was really courageous. And I was super proud of our local uh, mayor's office and city council. But at any rate, when we got kind of charged with working with the city in relationship to how life sports might look, this, this crate, you know, made it a little bit crazy. Um, but in some ways, this is really good for programming. We had much smaller numbers of kids. We couldn't serve as many kids at the center as we had in the past because of social distancing, which was at that time 10 feet apart. We had much lower staff to youth ratios, right? Because we had to have under 10, one adult for under 10 or 10 people in a group was the largest you could have. We had one adult for all of those, which ended up being really powerful because that adult and that group of kids and that group of 10 really, really connected and bonded and built a strong relationship like a group would or a team would over the course of the entire summer. Mass, um, we pivoted a lot of our life sports activity from team-based competitive kinds of situations where you're playing football against each other to more individualized instruction where they're running the football and they're um, trying to increase their speed and getting better themselves over time as opposed to like thinking about how they improve their performance um, in comparison with others. Uh, equipment for everyone. It was a huge, huge thing, but every kid got their own ball. Um, they had their own crayons, they had their own scissors, and uh, at the end of the camp, they got to take those home with them. And, and that was really powerful because we know what just having the equipment alone could do for kids in this situation. No visitors, no volunteers, no donors that could come do partnerships. And the other thing that the kids really miss were field trips. So they usually go to the pool or the zoo. And of course, those were um, a no-no last summer. But um, we did have some great data from our, from our um, community-based program, I did want to say that we found very similar outcomes to the previous year at Beatty. And so kids still grew in their sets. Um, the implementation fidelity of the curriculum was a little bit loosey-goosey. And I think that was really because of just the chaotic situation of running programs. So imagine every time you went from soccer to basketball, all the equipment had to be cleaned. You had to hand sanitize. You had to be really careful about water bottles. Um, and it was just a, a very, very stressful time, I think, for our staff. And so they were a little bit worn down and, and the fidelity of what we were doing was a little bit um, less invasive, less intensive. But nonetheless, the kids were in person. They went for eight weeks and uh, that we really um, had a great time last summer, um, even, even in the pandemic. So um, this third way in which we 
pivoted what is probably the most innovative and exciting for us, but um, we were not allowed to have camp on campus. So think in a normal year, we would have 600 kids in our athletic facilities, in our swimming pool, in our classrooms on the university campus, in our horseshoe football stadium having lunch. And um, that was shut down last year. And we knew, you know, kids come back year after year, 53% of them, and we had to do something. So we created this sport in a bag virtual program with our partners, again, the Lindy N. Ponte Foundation, the City of Columbus, um, the uh, Adam H, our Alcohol and Drug and Mental Health Board here in Columbus, and a lot of other people stepped up to make this happen. But we served virtually, I'm gonna show you the platform in a second, kids five to 14 years old. We had 424 young people um, sign up. They got chalk talk lessons virtually, like um, in person, right? Virtually live um, two times a week over the course of the six weeks. Um, they would pick up their equipment for the two weeks, whether it was a soccer ball and a chalk talk gardening experience or an arts and craft thing that this young girl's doing in this picture, or they would get the next week their football and their jump rope or their last to band for strength and conditioning activities. But every two weeks they would come pick up their supplies, pick up their equipment as well as their incentives. So the more the kid participated in the program virtually and through this platform I'm gonna show you, um, they earned points and then they um, were able to earn t-shirts and hats and um, lots of OSU Buckeye gear, um, as well as invitations to celebrity Zoom sessions um, where we had people like Michael Conley Jr. from the Utah Jazz, who's a past Buckeye, Coach Urban Meyer was our celebrity Zoom one afternoon. Um, and they earned these incentives um, because of their active participation. So I'm gonna take you to the Sport in the Bag platform now um, if there aren't any questions, is everybody okay? I think we're doing great, Dawn. This is just this is just wonderful and awesome. And well, okay, so this this is fun. I love showing this. So Taylor, can you see the the sport about platform on the screen? Yes, it's perfect. Okay, cool. So so when kids entered and signed in, they essentially showed up on this virtual platform, and these were each week's activities. Um, and so for the first week, you know, they would go in and they would have access to their basketball sport videos, right? So this is our team member, Coach Noel. She provides kind of an overview, but this is Coach Day, who is um, one of our coaches at Ohio State, actually, who ran these videos and did these drills for us. But All right, for so this next drill, we're going to move on to passing. All right, we're going to work on partner passing here. So for, we're going to start with just one ball. We're going to work on bounce pass and then chest, chest pass. Then I'm going to bring another ball in and we're going to work on simultaneous, simultaneous passing. All right. So first thing we got, Isaiah, we're going to work on just a normal bounce pass. I'm going to start. So, so you can kind of get a flavor of that there. Um, but Coach Day is focusing on passing. And when he wraps up at the end, he really focuses in on, um, you know, what it would be to, you know, work together and how they were good teammates and how Coach Day and, and Isaiah worked together in that particular setting. Um, this is our dance. Uh, we had an amazing dance leader, um, Coach Sarah, you know, and, and so you can walk through her dance activities with the kids. And, you know, over the course of like 20 different video sessions. Hey, everybody, we are going to learn the Funky session. Town Challenge. So get up, spread apart with your team and let's go. The first part is you're going to put your hand out, start with your right hand, then your left hand out in front of you. I'm going to take you to the end because it's more fun. It's about to start over. Ready? <laughs> Shrugs. Hit, hit, in, out. <laughs> Good. So, so that's the, you know the dance that they learned over the course of the first week, right? Um, as they move forward with all the different virtual sessions. But you saw the kids were part of the video, but then kids are at home logging into this platform and learning the dance with the video over time as they participate in live sports during the summer. Um, additionally, we had health, um, a health curriculum here where kids could learn about what was a life sports athlete, how to eat healthy, how to hydrate. And then this is up here where they logged all their points. Um, so then 
they could put in their points and then we would be able to track and then um, provide the incentives as they went along. So um, that's kind of the, the squirt platform. As you go back through the, um, through the uh, platform on different days, what you end up seeing are um, week two was like basketball and week four was football. And, and um, you know, it just depended on which week you were at, the kinds of videos that you accessed and the types of sport instruction you got. But then you had the equipment at home from your sport in a bag so you could practice. Um, which was really, really, really powerful. So um, with that said, that was our sport in a bag platform. Um, over time, we found, um, oh, I did want to share this. So this, the Chalk Talk lessons were live. So this is an example of a curriculum that we do live in person around listening and communicating. Um, and essentially what you see here is kind of working on teamwork and talking about listening. And so what they did is had each kid sort of draw a picture, anything that they wanted. And then they had to verbally and non-verbally express and communicate to their group members what it was that they drew. And then their team members try to like draw whatever they think they said, right? Um, and so we do this activity in person at Life Sports, but we did it virtually in these small little breakout rooms with pairs of kids where they got to take turns trying to express to each other what it was that they were um, um, doing virtually. And so it was really fun and creative to think about the different ways that they could do um, do this uh, Chalk Talk experience in person. Um, and then this is a little bit of how, how the debriefing would be. Pay attention to the framework, what, so what, no what. So what did we do today? So what, what did we learn? Why was it helpful? And then now what is, how do we take it from here and go use it at home? or at school or in the community. And, and again, that's that transfer piece that we often miss when we're teaching life skills and social skills. We did see a lot of great perception changes among our kids last summer in relationship to our sets outcomes. So we were really excited about that, as well as some, you know, sitting in on that healthy lifestyle too, especially among our most engaged campers. Um, so we didn't have all of our kids participate in our survey data, but um, at any rate, it, it was still cool to see some growth um, in the kids' um, perceptions of their skill sets over time. So, okay, so sport in a bad camp, you kind of get it. We've got that platform. Uh, what happened though is we still needed booster sessions. So we had this program. We also had the in-person program at Beatty. We wanted to keep kids engaged. So we created this both opportunities. So we had two opportunities in the fall and the winter. They could come in person and do socially distance mitigated safety, you know, driven activities, or we could come and, and log into our virtual fall clinics. Um, and so the clinics here is the same kind of platform as before. Um, you know, one of our football coaches at OSU was running football drills. Um, the same, our soccer coach um, was running soccer coach. The strength and conditioning um, coach from uh, our hockey program, this great accent was running the different drills for the, the um, clinics. But um, most importantly, I'd like to show this in-person clinic. So normally when we did clinics pre-COVID, we'd have 100, 150 kids in the, in the horseshoe, right, on the turf, and we'd be running programs, and we'd have 25, you know, four groups of 25 rotating through stations or something. But what we did do this year because of COVID was we had two community-based sites. We still weren't allowed to have things on campus, but we ran two different clinics at both of those sites. So technically it was one clinic, it was all football, but we ran four sessions of the same clinic in order to have smaller groups, more time on task, but also to be able to really individualize and make sure everybody was safe, right? So again, it was the same amount of time our team would have played in doing one big one that lasted longer, um, but we spread it out and put it in place in different settings, which I think was really, really helpful and is something that we'll take forward um, as we move move into the future because we know those smoke groups, we can build more relationships, we get more connections, the kids can get to know each other, the group dynamics can form and they can really gel and begin to learn from each other and with each other. So um, a good take home for that. The other part that I thought was cool about both the Sport and Get Bag Summer Program and this program was that the kids had opportunities to practice the drills at home with their sport equipment, but then send us videos. And so I wanna show you some of these flip grids real quick before we kind of talk about lessons that we've learned so that um, you can see, see where we are. Um, I, I may have, I may need your help, Taylor, getting to this one to make sure I'm in the right place. So let's see. Can 
Can you see that flip grid? Absolutely. Okay. So, so kids then in this, this particular virtual program with football, and they got to actually, uh, you know, take the online virtual football videos. But then what they did is they video, they worked on them at home and they got extra incentive points and their kind of homework was to go and practice the drill at home with their family. And so these two kids are actually, um, they belong to a refugee community here in, the, in, in, in Columbus and they're practicing their handoffs, right? In this particular video, and this is just cute as can be, right? Um, and then you've got another kid here who's practicing, you know, with his sibling, right? And they're sending their, uh, and these are the exact routes and drills that we had in our videos that the kids are now practicing. Um, this one here. You just do five yards now, go. And cut, you gotta throw it and cut. Don't cut towards me. 10 yards, 10, go. So now they're 10 doing yards and cut. 10 yards. But Don't cut towards me. Most surprising things that came from these homemade videos and then the sport, you know, the life sports at home were that these kids were now practicing with their parents and the moms were out teaching their kids and using the same cues and feedback and instruction that we try to hit on um, at camp. And so it was just really, really powerful. Um, these are siblings and their parent is, is watching. Um, but the opportunity for the family and the, the cohesive unit to play and connect during this time of the pandemic, um, when when everything else is shut down, was one of the major you know take homes that we had from our program over time. Um, and and I don't know how you put a number on that value, but um, it was really really a great lesson learned. So so those are our clinics, and that shows you the flip grid. I think it's pretty cool. Can you see the slides now again? Yes, you are. Up All right. Down. So, so let me wrap up a little bit and, and talk to you about some of our lessons learned and then field some questions. Um, you know, I put these on two sides, you know, in, in general within life sports, what we know is we can take sport, which is fun. It's a great hook. It's playful. And if we design it correctly, we can teach kids sports skills, right? And healthy lifestyle behaviors, but also use it as a setting to really emphasize our self-control effort, teamwork and social responsibility, right? And in fact, in some ways, our social skill learning probably is amplified because it's play-based, right? And because it's based in a setting that these kids love to play. Um, we know that quality instruction really matters. And so our curriculum that we have that has very specific cues and feedback principles and, and ways of like teaching that, that like if you're not a soccer person and you don't know how to pass a soccer ball, the curriculum is written so that even someone who's a novice can use the instructional guide to go teach kids how to pass or how to shoot or how to defend. Um, and, and I think our time um, spent doing that adaptation to make it really user friendly was well, well paid off and something really neat and unique to life sports. Feedback is important, of course, relationships and friendships and um, connections with caring adults and especially creating them over long periods of time. We know um, the kids that stay with us the longest grow the most, um, but we really do target kids that you know need us the most. So we try to get the kids that um, don't have opportunities, don't have access to our camps. We intentionally try to recruit them from the community. We provide a lot of supports like transportation to make sure they can get here. Um, and in the end, it makes a huge, huge difference where um, our community needs it most. In terms of post-COVID and these adaptations, you know, we really found, you know, technology, although in the beginning was such a hassle, it was really, really, um, it can be such an important platform, right? That, that learning could happen virtually and it did. And in those live Chalk Talk sessions, our, our Chalk Talk instructors will say the kids created peer friendships. They were friends virtually, but we had to work to create it and we had to maneuver the groups and pair them up in different ways and create this culture on expectations of engagement. You got to turn your camera on. You got to use the chat. We got to, when we're, you know, when it's our turn, how do you call on everybody? How do you hold them accountable for participation in this virtual space? But when we did it, we saw amazing, amazing growth. Um, the technology utilization with parents and caregivers was really this strong asset that we saw. 
we definitely had a lot of parents who needed help getting Wi-Fi. We got them Chromebooks. We helped them learn how to log in. We got them, you know, hooked up into the, the sport of ad platform and we had to go do home visits and technical support to do all that. But once they did get used to it, we saw parents engaged with their kids in ways they hadn't been before. And so we really see it, this virtual and technological innovation as a way in which we can further engage parents in a fun, interactive way to be with their kids, to have positive interactions and just to create some, some good, you know, um, positive pro-social norms of, of engagement um, in families. The live sports at home game uh, guides were very sort of surprising. I kept thinking, we're just gonna distribute 10,000 bags and put equipment in kids' hands. And you know, it's the spray and pray idea. But during the COVID-19 shutdown, um, it really made a difference for some of our families. And, and, and that was very surprising um, to me because they picked up those guides and they used them and the parents were helping them do those activities with their little five-year-old babies and things like that. Um, and then the last thing that I think is most important is that we can't just begin doing these programs in eight weeks or 14 weeks or whatever, but boosters and transfer um, is what really matters. So how do we take what they learned in the classroom, in life sports, on the, on the basketball court and the football field, and how do we use it outside of there? Um, and we can do that through our clinics on campus with our athletic teams. We could do it virtually through these Flipgrid platforms. Um, we could host, you know, virtual sessions during the academic year to keep kids engaged. Um, but the booster sessions, I think, are something that we really, really need to to do further. And I think our team will continue to use that platform um, as an amplifier to the work we do in person with kids. Last thing I want to say, and this is kind of my soapbox, but just to kind of, you know, most of you I think are probably behavioral mental health folks down there in, in um, South Carolina and Southeast US, but just remember sport is the setting, right? That young people can love, right? And 51 million kids participate in it each year, right? There's high school sport, there's club sport, there's recreation sport, there's, there's tidbits for little five-year-olds playing soccer um, and there's PE and um, after school, boys and girls clubs that have sports. And, and what we sometimes have a bad taste in our mouth about sport is because it hasn't been designed the right way. It has been designed to win and to beat the other people and be competitive and work hard and not have fun and run laps when you lose games. And, and the point about life sports and a point about play and sport is that if it's designed right, Right. If we design it right, like we do at Life Sports, where it focuses on improvement over time, we intentionally teach the life skills and the social skills and the sports skills, we, where we build the relationships, connect the kids, that setting of sport can be a really wonderful place to create um, really important outcomes for young people um, as we move forward. So if you want to learn more about Life Sports, we just launched or relaunched or redid our website. It's pretty cool. So you can jump on there and check it out. And then certainly you're more than welcome to email me um, and I will field other questions if you don't have time today to do so. So how'd I do, Taylor? Incredible. I mean, oh. the program is inspiring. The capacity for innovation that y'all showed throughout COVID is I mean, it's, it's overwhelming. I mean, the amount of love that you're really showing to those kids and their families and the community, um, um, it, this has been such a pleasure and I can't wait to learn more. I did sneak onto the website and and it, it, y'all please, by all means, check out the website, look at the content um, and access this and see how we can maybe integrate this work into the work that we're doing now. I love athletics and this is phenomenal. So um, give folks a time, some time to type any questions for um, Dr. Anderson Butcher into the chat. Um, and while we're waiting on y'all to populate questions, I will go ahead and pop up our last poll. And uh, here we go. Y'all wouldn't mind completing that for us as well. And Donna, I, I, I do have a, a compassionate curiosity. I know Life Sports has been around since 2009. I'm mm -hmm. curious about what did it look like? You did so much teaming, right? There's so many different individuals and organizations that are, that are working around this. Mm -hmm. What did it look like in its infancy? Yeah, so uh, great question, Taylor. So I'm going to talk, let me share a little bit about the history of where we came from. So um, the federal government 
in the 60s um, created the National Youth Sport Program and it's called NYSP. And so if you think about the 60s, we've got race riots going on and a huge civil rights movement. And so the feds thought the way that they could alleviate crime and violence in the inner cities was to channel dollars to universities across the country to provide sport um, on their campuses. And essentially, you know, bus kids in, throw them in the pool, wear them out, take them back to the neighborhoods and, and things would be, you know, better. Um, but, you know, but what happened is millions and millions of dollars were invested in this NYSP program. There were over 300 universities across the country who had it. Ohio State had the second largest one. Um, and, and over time, the money from the feds just kept dwindling and dwindling. So many of them, they, they didn't have data, they didn't have outcomes, they had not done curriculum to be able to demonstrate evidence and replicability. Uh, and every kind of place kind of had its own homegrown intervention. And so the money dried, you know, dried up over time to where in 2007, Ohio State, um, our money flew through athletics, other campuses, maybe it flew through like continuing education or like kinesiology departments. Um, athletics was paying about $200,000 a year to run NYSP and the feds were giving 30,000. And so at Ohio State, where we have, you know, one of the few revenue generating departments, you know, we could take in and bear some of those dollars and expenses over time. Most universities had already shut down and then the economy tanked in 2008 and Gene Smith, our AD then, who still is our AD, looked at my colleague in athletics, Jerry Davis and said, what do you wanna do with this thing? Like, what can we do? And, and you know, it's been a historical outreach agenda for OSU for many, many years, 30 plus years. And so um, Jerry found me in the university and we started building out partnerships. Um, and we and our call from Gene was, uh, it has to be tied to the academic core of the university and it needs to be more than camp, right? And we're Ohio State, it better be damn good, right? And so <laughs> so those were our challenges. And, and um, I was sitting over in social work and kinesiology with partnerships with the city. I worked with the Ohio Department of Ed. I had created, you know, synergistic relationships with communities and schools and boys and girls clubs. And then athletics, you know, brought in their understanding and knowledge and, and event management, you know, skill set and just brilliancy around sport and coaching. And, and we developed over time what it is today. So it's been a lot of work, but it's, it's pretty cool when you look back on the last 13, 14 years. Um, and you said it, Taylor, we have an amazing team. I mean, you guys saw Becky in our video, who was the, sort of the narrator. She's fabulous. She's been part of our um, team for about 12 years. And then Jerry Davis, is over in athletics and he leads the Wolstein Leadership Academy over there. Um, and we just rely and lean on students and volunteers and, and just really great, um, great partners and deans and people at Ohio State who still invest and believe in the work. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's an incredible example now. to me. It's a lot different now than it was. Cause I mean, now we have, it's ready to be launched and replicated in other places. It could be picked up and taken to somewhere else where, you know, in 2000, you know, in, in, you know, 2012, it couldn't have been, we maybe just had the Chalk Talk curriculum written, you know, but now we have all the sports written and Chalk Talk. And so, and we've tested it out in the field so it could go be done at a boys and girls club or in a rec center or whatever. So, so it's definitely been a long journey um, over time, but we've been tweaking our curriculum and, and really tightening it up to make sure we get the outcomes that we want and, and the fidelity that we need. So um, thank you for that comment. Um, we do have one more question. And before, uh, before I feel that, I just wanna say, you know, it, it, it's really powerful to see the growth of your program and have the knowledge that that means that from, from the beginning, you had so much buy-in and support and every player really had a belief in your mission. And that's, that's incredibly inspiring. So we have one question here that says, what kind of training around cultural competency does life sports provide to its instructors? Additionally, how did that programming address the social justice movements that intersected with the COVID-19 pandemic? Phenomenal question. Wow, yeah. All right, so, so say the first part of it again. So uh, cultural competency training. Yeah. So, so, you know, it was really funny when we first started because uh, Jerry would be like, oh, we should have a half day training, right? And we would just do like safety or um, concussions or, uh, you know, ch ch the things that you had to do 
to run camps on campus or in anywhere, right? Um, and then, you know, what we found is we only had time to do what was mandated, right? And then, and then of course, things at Penn State hit and Sandusky, you know, this all that was going on there. And all of a sudden we had to add in child welfare and safety concerns about reporting abuse and neglect. And so it, we now have a two day extensive training for all of our staff. And we do everything from, you know, understanding the kids and their backgrounds. We have kids come talk to our staff and tell them about their lived experiences. Um, we'll have case, you know, narratives of like something that happened at camp and have our staff try to figure out how to navigate it and what they would do um, and really try to, you know, make it real real. We also do, you know, we get our staff out on the lacrosse field and they all have sticks and we we teach them, we say, put your kid hat on and we plant some bad kids in there and have them practice about what, what they would do when Johnny decides not to play today, you know, and how they would interact with that. And so, so we spend a lot of time with our staff talking about where our kids come from, some of the challenges that they have, helping them understand, you know, trauma informed practices, mm -hmm. you know, like, so well, many of our kids they're escalated very easily. And so we have to work with our staff to be able to let them reframe that behavior escalation as, you know, sort of um, a stress response, right? A coping mechanism as opposed to being belligerent, right? Mm -hmm. And um, we, did, we did have to over time, which I think would be important to know is we do hire, um, like on campus, we have full-time behavioral support specialists who their whole job is helping the coaches and the chalk talk instructors with behavior and with you know supports so that the kids can continue in the activities where they're at and, and that's been an important staffing piece for the vulnerable group that we teach um, that makes a lot of difference um, the other thing we do is we hire not just college students but we have about a third of our community or that third of our team in our camps sometimes in our community-based sites i would say it's probably 70 percent but um, two thirds more, um, but they're, they're counselors in the community, they're um, faith-based leaders in the community, they're teachers at the schools or coaches in the community, um, sometimes parents of kids in the camp, and they are teaching too. So we don't just hire young kids that are just you know, studying in school, we bring in seasoned experts who reflect the diversity of our kids um, and also the, um, have a little bit more experience and know-how to be able to, to do the hard work when it's needed. So. Um, that's the first question. Um, in terms of social justice, wow, you know, I, I have a graduate student now, Travis, um, and we were just talking about this this morning, right, and, and how we should and could do more of it at Life Sports. Um, that when we were writing the curriculum, you could imagine me, how old I would have been, like, what, 30, 35 or whatever, and, and I, we did a, a focus group with kids one time, and they said, you need to make this more real life to the streets. This needs some street cred. Like, and I can remember this young participant who had been a member of Life Sports for a couple of years, and she just flat out told me, like, these activities are like for white people. We need to have, you know, some things that are relevant to our contextual, you know, where we live, what happens in my community where there's gunshots and I've had friends die and um, family members, you know, who, who are, um, you know, impacted by violence in their neighborhoods. And so, so we really have done a good job, I think, of trying to revise our curriculum and give real life examples that reflect the circumstances and social context where our kids come from. Um, and they've helped us to do that and tell us how to do that. Um, it was funny, with, when we were early on, we were talking about sets and the one area where we struggled to get the impact in the data was on social responsibility. So you talk about like, what do you do with Black Lives Matter or all the things that are going on? But I went to the kids and I, we did another focus group and I said, what do you think about this, this term? What about this word? What does this mean when we try to focus on, on it in life sports? And they were like, it's, you know, well, it means social responsibility. It means do the right thing. It means following the rules. It means being a leader. And I said, well, they, they, I go, well, why do you think we don't get, should we change the word? Should we change what it means? And they said, no, you just need to teach it better. You know, and you need to, you know, make it more real and give us more examples about how we can use it, you know, in real life. And, and so um, they didn't want us to throw it out. They wanted us to do more with it. Um, the place where we did do a lot of work last summer, I mean, it was hard because it was virtual, right? Um, most of it, but in our Youth Leadership Academy, which is our high school age youth, they actually organize some community service projects where they, um, 
they went out and, and, you know, went to one of the marches that was downtown and passed out water and PPE. Um, we had a kid who was camper of the year in the sport in a bag program. So they each had, you know, an opportunity to create their own service project or their own way of giving back. And one of these kids, um, he had, he had seen homeless families on the side of the road. And, and I have, I have him on video. It's absolutely amazing. But he went home and told his mom that he wanted to make PPE bags for them and have them in the car. So when he saw others in the future, he could stop and give them their own supply of, of you know, hand sanitizer and masks and, and um, wipes and things like that. And so, you know, just powerful things happen, but um, certainly there's more work that we all can do. Um, I'd like to see our team um, help the kids better understand the why of why they don't have access to sport like other kids or why their school shut down for a year and kids in some of the other communities had full on instruction, um, why they didn't have good Chromebooks and Wi-Fi and, you know, and, and it's not just in our urban, urban communities, it's in our rural um, ones too. We have a rural community with one third of their kids doesn't even have broadband or any way to even get mm -hmm. cell so, you know, coverage. So they couldn't do anything virtually for when there was no school. And so, you know, helping the kids understand those realities and those social conditions and how they came to be. And then, you know, helping them build those skills so that they know how to have conversations and host conversations and challenge, you know, um, the way of things are done in ways that people will listen, I think are, are really, really important um, next steps for us in the work that we do for sure. So I appreciate that. Um, and I, I just sent, there's a great article called by Ginswright and Cartwright. I can send it to you if you want to pass it on, but they have a, it's old, but it's called Youth Development um, from a Social Justice, you know, what's missing in youth development? And they say it's social justice, right? That we're building all these strengths and we're teaching all these life skills, but we're not, you know, letting the kids really understand and encouraging them to use their voice to lead change. So um, it's a great paper. So I just sent it to Travis today, which is funny. Well, you send it my way and I'll make sure that our participants have access to that we can add it as a resource um, to the where we're going to be housing um, our video today on our YouTube channel. It'll be available on the website. We'll make sure to share all of those incredible links. Don, I, I don't even think the word inspiring is, is enough. Um, your work is incredible. The program is incredible. The the kids are incredible. The stories are, are are very, very powerful. And we would love to learn more and share more through the Behavioral Alliance South Carolina. And thank you so much for spending this extra time with us today. I know that our audience has still been here the whole time. So the word captivating still comes to mind. Um, appreciate you immeasurably. Can't wait to connect back with you. Thank you so much to everyone who joined us today. We are very grateful for your continued interest in our programs and our projects. If there's any way that we can connect with you further or we can collaborate, please reach out to us at bask at mailbox.se.edu. Like, follow, and subscribe to all of our social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube so that we can engage and build out our community of practice. Dawn, thank you so much. You're a wonderful human and it's always a pleasure to get to chat with you. All right, y'all have a wonderful afternoon. Bye now.